The following is a keynote speaker presentation from the ACM 97 conference, the next 50 years of computing. ACM 97 brought together over 2,000 leaders and luminaries from all aspects of the computing world to discuss and predict what the next 50 years of computing has in store. ACM 97 underwriters were Computer World, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Sun Microsystems. Sponsors were Cadmus Journal Services, IBM, Netscape, Popular Science, Sheridan Printing Company Incorporated, Silicon Graphics Incorporated, SoftBank, and Unisys. The event also included a major exposition with a paleotechnic look back to the future from the year 2047 and a specially commissioned book, Beyond Calculation, featuring essays on the next 50 years of computing by luminaries and pioneers in the field. The ACM 97 conference was chaired by Robert Metcalf and emceed by James Burke. Details on how to obtain more information on ACM 97 follow this program. Ladies and gentlemen, James Burke. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice to be here. This conference is going to look at the next 50 years, and in doing so, it's going to be examining the process of change in a field that has already generated more change in the last 50 years than perhaps in the whole of history that went before. And that rate of change is accelerating. Out where I come from, in the world of ordinary users, that accelerating rate of change can often leave people confused, when by the time you've got round to reading the manual these days, the model is already obsolete, if you can understand the manual in the first place. Now, the attitude which this situation engenders always reminds me of the story of the depressive who gets a few days off from the clinic, goes to the beach to get himself a tan. A couple of days later, back in the hospital, his psychiatrist gets a postcard from his patient. The message on the card from the depressive often fits the attitude of the average user to what the computer industry is throwing at them every day because the message on the card reads, having a wonderful time, why? <laughs> the problem is, of course, that second-guessing change so you're ready for it, which is, I suppose, what this conference is all about, can often be difficult because of the serendipitous way in which change itself happens and the number of wildly different inputs that can often be involved in that process. Let me give you a quick example from my own field, the history of technology. Take the case of this, the toilet roll. Now, we know that when the Chinese invented paper, this was probably not the first thing they had in mind for the use of the brilliant invention. No, the history of paper is not an ineluctable move over the centuries towards the bathroom. The continuous roll paper production system that makes this roll possible arrives in England in the early mid-19th century, just when the cholera epidemic and new sewage systems and vitreous china lavatories put the idea of hygiene into people's heads. But the continuous roll process itself only gets there in the first place because some guys are accidentally out in France and they pick up the patent for it while buying the patent for something else they had really got in mind, which was a patent for a food preservation system invented by a champagne bottler in France to feed Napoleon's armies, who are winning their wars with highly mobile horse artillery made possible thanks to lightweight cannon, made possible thanks to a new cannon boring machine invented by an Englishman using a new kind of steel for the cutting head. Now, the steel is invented a little bit earlier in order to provide a better clock spring for navigators because when you're going west to exploit the colonists, <laughs> we, we saw nothing wrong with taxation without representation. <laughs> the BBC wouldn't function without it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you need to know when you're doing that what time it is back at base 
If you know that, you know how much later the sun came up locally and therefore what time zone you're in. Now, the development of a new navigational gizmo to let them do that with a spring called Harrison's Chronometer was triggered in the first place by a gigantic prize offered by the British Parliament after a certain admiral with the wonderful name of Sir Cloudsley Shovel who is on his way back to England one foggy night in 1707 and makes a serious navigational boo-boo and hits the rocks and the whole fleet and him and all these men go down and all drown. So it could be said that the toilet roll comes from serious 18th century navigational problems. But look at the inputs all the way that move events towards the emergence of this humble object. Navigation technology, clocks, steel, artillery, food preservation, disease, vitreous china, and sewage systems. You see what I mean about it being hard to second guess the process of change that we are all here to talk about. The other thing that gives this conference particular relevance has to do with the subject of the conference itself, of course, computers. I mean, it is a truism, isn't it, that because of information technology, we stand today on the threshold of a social and scientific revolution, the like of which will make everything that went before look like slow motion. What makes it all the more challenging to forecast what that revolution will bring is the fact that all advances in information technology through history seem to cause a kind of explosion of innovation that in turn causes unforeseen secondary effects that ripple out in all directions. I mean, the alphabet seems to come up in a place called Serabit el Khadim down on the Sinai Peninsula around 1500 BC, primarily as a system for simplifying the various forms of hieroglyphic gobbledygook used by the various communities around, so that the, the guys running the mine, the Phoenician mining contractors who have a, a turquoise franchise from the Egyptians, can do easier deals with everybody. However, then, according to some scholars, the way the alphabet is read left to right, so it hits the right eye first, so it's processed by the left brain, that's the bit good at analysis and sequential operations, that makes it possible for the Greeks to use alphabetic thinking to develop logic and the reductionist thought processes that break the universe down into its smallest components and eventually give birth to the specialist gobbledygook now spoken by any PhD whose subject is not your own. <laughs> and the concomitant modern problem of change generated by people whose prime aim is to know more and more about less and less. A pal of mine at Oxford, for example, got his doctorate in Milton's use of the comma. <laughs> and, and, and take print, take print. I mean, take 17th century printed maps, okay? Printed maps. But what they did was encourage voyages of exploration that needed all kinds of new things to be invented for the purpose and as a result. New land registers to raise the backers' money with, new mortgage companies to facilitate that, new joint stock companies to take the risk out of the investment, and through them, a stock market to trade those stocks on, run by a new national bank, providing finance through new credit agencies for new enterprises running on another new thing called a business contract, whose mutual obligation clauses inspired the constitution of another new thing called the United States of America. So there seem to be two key patterns to be aware of. The sometimes quite marginal areas in which the, the domino effect of one field of innovation can cause quite major effects in another field, and the powerful innovation ripple effect, if you like, spreading out around each advance in the field of information and communications technology. A third element in this process by which change changes life seems to be in the way things get gradually less monolithic. In the past, there wasn't much room for other than a single right way to do things, or get boiled in oil, thumbscrewed, barbecued, or whatever. But gradually, information technology has made it a less monolithic world because each advance created more and more things for people to be and to do. I'm tempted to risk the wrath of one of our particularly eminent speakers and wonder if there's not a parallel between that and what happens in nature when major environmental change strikes. When the most successful organisms to survive, the ones that develop what, beyond what you might describe as the primeval Southern California life form, you know, lie on the beach, get born, lie on the beach, die. <laughs> Those successful ones seem to survive because of their ability to handle change by developing varieties of themselves so that whatever happens, however tough things get, one variety of the species will survive and through that, the species. 
I wonder if information technology doesn't give us the ability to do that same trick, to become, as a society, more complex and through diversity, develop a more flexible response to change repertoire and therefore survive better. Because if that is true, then what you're going to do over the next 50 years is cause an explosion of individualism that will put every institution under threat. Because as one of our speakers will be telling you, institutions are not built for flexibility and fast change. There's a great example of how hard institutions can fight change that I'd like to give you from the history of technology. All that stuff back in the 12th century when the European economy recovers from the so-called dark ages is generally put down to the arrival of new textile technology in the form of a new loom. The thing about the new loom is it has foot pedals, frees up the weaver's hands to throw the shuttle back and forward, weave much more cloth, much more quickly, much more cheaply. The well-established European traditional weavers' unions smash every one of these new looms they can find on the grounds that it will, quote, put people out of work, unquote, remarkably modern thinking for the 12th century. However, a generation later, when the dust is settled, market forces mean the loom is in use. And now the thread makers can't keep up, and they're making trouble. Until the answer comes in in the form of the spinning wheel from China, makes thread fast enough to keep up, put the wheel and the loom together, and the production of cloth goes up like a rocket. More riots. Because now for a mass market, the cloth is linen, made from plants because they're cheap, rather than wool made from sheep because they're expensive. So the rioters this time are in the well-established woolen industry. However, market forces mean that soon everybody's wearing this new cheap cloth, and when they wear it out, throwing it away. So all over 14th century Europe, there's this gigantic and growing pile of linen rag. So the price of paper drops like a stone. Linen rag is the best raw material you can have, and it's now free. More riots. The woolen industry again, because parchment is sheepskin, and now it's too expensive to use. However, here we are with enough paper to stick on the walls, the scribes are overworked and in demand, and pretty soon the old established professional writers' guilds are going on strike for higher wages, because in the meantime it has become a seller's market. The Black Death has knocked off two-thirds of the population of Europe, the other one-third is inheriting like crazy, and there's not enough writing ability to go around for all the documentation necessary. <laughs> Until Gutenberg solves the problem by automating it with a printing press around 1450. Riots in that greatest of old established institutions, the Vatican. The Pope needs a printing press like a hole in the head because it will encourage what we would call free thinking. Until somebody realizes that you can use the printing press to print indulgences with. Now, <clears throat> now for those non-Catholics among you, an indulgence was a kind of spiritual credit note. Pay now, sin later. Anyway, with all the demand for printed salvation that follows, Rome makes a million money to build the Vatican, pay Michelangelo's bill, and generally get involved in certain prestige projects that make certain German clerics madder than hell at this cash and carry view of salvation. One of whom nails up a few mild remarks on the subject, and there, thanks to advances in textile technology and fought by institutions all the way, is the Reformation. It's a trifle oversimplified, but you get my drift. <laughs> Institutionalized thinking. What, what I'm saying is, institutionalized thinking doesn't like unexpectedly new ways of doing things. Like the lady in the hotel elevator, a man gets in, she doesn't know, the doors close, they start to rise. He says, your room or mine, baby. And she says, if you're going to argue about it, forget it. <laughs> what I'm saying is, that there is a built-in accident waiting to happen between this industry and what it's going to do over the next 50 years and the major social structures. I mean, when a manager in Boise, Idaho, is using a Japanese corporate satellite to run CAD-CAM units in Argentina the way the London accountants say the Taiwan headquarters wants using software uplink live from Sydney, what happens to national sovereignty? The final area of change to be aware of, besides the domino effect of innovation, the key importance of information technology, and the way things get more complicated, is, I suppose, what you might call the user effect, the way the marketplace can influence the direction of innovation. And you don't need to be a PhD to be a user with influence. James Watt's pump might never have done other than drain a few mines had it not been for the surge in the population with cash in their pockets and a desire for metal pots and pans that kicked off the Industrial Revolution or the thousands of people who just didn't like the Ford Edsel. 
These world-changing consumer decisions don't result from debates and focus groups. Individuals make individual choices all by themselves. But if it happens a million times over, and it can, it changes everything. Theoretically, that's what we all do at elections. Okay, we have some good speakers for you, great speakers for you, and they have some very provocating, provocative and exciting things to say uh, on the way about the industry and what it's capable of doing over the next 50 years, and I thank them for taking on this task. We'll kick off with Gordon Bell talking about what we all want to know about, the law of prediction. He's followed by Carver Mead, who's going to be looking at semiconductors and whether or not we can expect Moore's law to go on operating through to 2047. Next comes Joel Birnbaum with a challenging look at the alternate types of computing that lie ahead and which is likely to predominate. He's followed by Patty Mass to discuss what you might describe as your future significant other, aka the electronic agent. Next comes Nathan Mervold on the matter of software and who's going to be doing it, or rather what's going to be doing it. And today ends with fun and frolic and who knows what from the world of 21st century entertainment in the form of Bran Ferran from Disney. Tomorrow we open with a look ahead to whether or not we'll be there in 2047 with a look from ex-Secretary of Defence William Perry, who will be talking about computer and war. I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> then comes former uh, Finance Minister to Chile, Fernando Flores, who's talking about the impact of information technology on your business and how deals will be done 50 years from now. <clears throat> Next, Vint Cerf, with an intriguing look at a future <clears throat> where the internet and computing are invisible, pervasive and everywhere. Brenda Laurel follows Vint with a very provocative look, look at computers in culture in a way that I think will surprise and excite you. Immediately after lunch tomorrow, we have my countryman, Morris Wilkes, who wrote the first book on computer programming and whose talk is called What's to Come is Still Unsure. What it's about exactly, I'm still unsure. Then comes Elliot Soloway on what the computer industry is going to do to education between now and 2047, and at the very different world of qualifications that that may bring. Finally, tomorrow, Reid Hunt, FCC chairman, talking about what telecommunications is going to do to education and most other things. On Wednesday, the final conference day is a short one. It starts with a presentation by that well-known science fiction writer, Bruce Sterling, who, by the way, suggested that the best way to use the polling paddles was to see if you could do the Mexican wave. So you can guess his prediction is going to be far from predictable. After him comes Raj Reddy, out on a limb with teleportation, time travel, and immortality. And last, but very far from least, Nobel Prize winner in quantum chromodynamics, Murray Gell-Mann, will address the complex matter of the convergence of physics, biology, and information technology, a subject that in itself, by almost by definition, kind of wraps it all up. So after Murray, that's the end. <laughs>